Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well today. This is Robin from One Paper Street. So for those who don't know me, uh, I am a greeting card designer. Um, I also dabble in watercolor painting and colored pencil work and um, Copics and really just anything else that I, uh, I think I'm gonna find interesting. So I'm happy to be here with you all. Thank you for joining today. Um, today, we are going to spend a little bit of time with uh, some embossing powder you see here, but mostly we're going to spend some time watercolor painting. So I wanted to do a Christmas card uh, for, well, for Christmas because it's going to be coming up here in a few days, and I also wanted to play with my watercolors. So I figured that I would make a little Christmas card. Um, doesn't have to be something too difficult. I know sometimes I try to overcomplicate things and I try to do something really complex when sometimes it's just nice to do something simple. So we are gonna do something fun today with watercolors. And um, what I have in mind is uh, I have this stamp that I really like. I don't know if you can see it. Um, it says, may your days be merry and bright. It's in the shape of a Christmas tree. So I kind of thought, how cool would it be to have that Christmas tree and almost, I don't know if you can see it, but almost have it like um, a watercolor Christmas tree where you kind of have the base of the tree and the stamp just kind of sits right directly on it. So that's what we're going to do today. And then we're probably going to emboss the stamp after we get done um, putting it down on paper. But this is a really rough sketch. So you kind of get a feel for what we're probably going to do. Um, it always depends a little bit on, you know, whether it turns out the way you want it to, but I thought I would start by just kind of showing you how I prep my watercolor paper. So sorry if you hear some background noise, I'm just getting a couple things out, but really uh, what I wanted to do, what I like to do is um, I like to set my watercolor paper on something and then I like to just kind of pin it down because I find that the paper doesn't wrinkle as much or it doesn't warp, it doesn't kind of curl up. So that's what I'm gonna do. And um, I actually saw um, Christina Warner do something very similar um, for past cards, but I think it works really well. So I'm gonna do something similar, but we're gonna put our own spin on it. Um, and if you don't know who Christina Warner is, she's um, she also makes greeting cards. Uh, she's a wonderful designer. Um, and when I was first starting out, I got a lot of inspiration from her. So if you're ever looking for someone to check out, um, you're always welcome to thumb through my videos. But there are so many great designers out there, um, and she is definitely one of them. All right. So um, we're just going to put a little tape on the edges just so that it stays in place. And again, we don't need it to be perfect. We're not gonna do a full painting today. Some days we do, and then you want the you want the tape to be really precise, but today is not that day. All right. And um, not everybody tapes their paper down like this. Some people will wet the paper and then lay it down. Um, other people will not bother to tape it at all. So it really kind of depends on what you want to do and what type, what type of paper you're working with. Um, this is Kilimanjaro watercolor paper. It's cold press, 100% cotton. Um, and I find that this is, sorry Kilimanjaro, it's not actually my favorite. Um, I use it for small projects. I use it for projects where I'm not doing the whole page with water. But if I decide that I do want to do the full page with water, I usually don't do this. Uh, I usually don't use this paper because it it does get really like I don't know like rounded, wrinkly. I don't know what the appropriate term is, but it just kind of gets warped. And um, yeah, so it's um it's not my favorite. All right, so what I'm gonna do to kind of actually figure out where I want the coloring to go 
is I'm just going to put this stamp here. And then I even maybe want to move it down just a smidge. And then I'm going to lay my tape right here ish. Whoops. Put that back in a second. So just kind of want to make sure it's even ish. You can always trim it up later, but I'm I'm measuring it against here and against here to try and see if it's even. That looks pretty good. So then I'm gonna grab my next piece of tape. I'm making it a little longer than it needs to be because I'd rather have a little more on there than not enough. I'm gonna put it about here. And I'm just gonna place that down. And then what I'm actually gonna do is um, get a third piece and just gonna shimmy that right about there so that the trunk is not fully covered. Maybe I need to bring it down just a little bit. And and maybe I'll bring it down just a little bit more. All right, so that looks about right. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I'm gonna lay that down. And then I think we're ready to do some watercolor painting. So the watercolor paints that I'm gonna be using is my Koi watercolors, I think it's a box of 48 colors. Um, I also have some, I have other watercolor colors, but um, I think that this is the one I'm gonna use for this card. Uh, and this has like a, um, a series of just a whole bunch of different colors. So if I'm looking to do something that I don't want to take a bunch of time mixing colors and things like that, um, then I'll I'll go ahead and use this. Um, I don't think these are these are not considered to be professional grade. At least I don't think um, these are more just like student grade colors. Um, but they're really nice, and so I try to use them wherever I can. So we're probably going to be doing some greens today, but I also kind of want to work in like some bright colors. So I may even like kind of tap into the reds, the purples maybe even a little bit of the blue. So this could turn out to be a non-traditional Christmas card. We'll see. Um, but basically, I'll actually just use the palette that comes in the box so I can show you what it looks like. Um, they are well used. Um, I used them a lot when I was first learning how to watercolor. Um, but there's 48 colors here. Uh, and they're relatively small half, half pans, but um, I've been using them for a while, and you can see that there's still quite a bit of paint left. So um, what I'm going to do real quick is I'm just going to get them wet. And I've got two glasses off to the side that I hold water in. So I've got this kind of yellowish, not so pretty watercolor or water cup, and then I've got this, this glass cup. So I always use the yucky looking cup for my dirty water and the pretty cup for my clean water. So <laughs> it's just a nice visual cue. So I'm just going to, I don't have like a dropper or a spray bottle here today. I probably should, but so we're just going to be a little quick about it. Just, uh, I'm have some of my stuff just packed away and I haven't gotten it out in a while so I have a spray bottle somewhere and I just it's just somewhere that I don't know where it is so 
we're going to take the old fashioned route. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just getting my paints wet because it takes them a minute to activate. And so if you wet them before you're actually ready to use them, then they're a little bit more pliable. Um, and you'll see when they're really dry, they almost look cracked like a, like the floor of a desert. And that's just because they don't have any liquid in them. Um, if you look at like acrylic paints or oil paints, um, or even like watercolors that are in a tube, there's a lot of liquid still in them. And so they look a lot more, I don't know, full of moisture. They're not as crackly. But when a watercolor, like even if you have watercolor in a tube and you just let it sit, eventually it starts to just look super dry because it's, it's got nothing to activate it. So, all right. So I'm going to just kind of set these off to the side. And the other thing I keep near me when I'm doing some watercolor painting is I usually keep like a um, some kind of washcloth. You can use a paper towel. I just, I like to use a washcloth because then I can just toss it in the laundry and then reuse it again. Um, so you'll see it's got some, I don't know if you can see, but it's got paint on it because I've used it several times before. All right, so I, think I'll just kind of keep this near me so that I can show you all what I'm about to do. But I think what I want to do is almost give it kind of like an abstract look. And I almost want to use these blues right here. So I think hmm I think some of these teals, some of these blues, maybe I'll drop in some red for like bulbs so that they just look like bulbs. And then maybe what I'll also do is I'll get a little bit of salt. So this is salt and you can sprinkle it on the picture and it almost just gives it kind of a fun little look. So I'll put that off to the side over here. Okay, so Let's get started. I am going to put water on my paper. This is called a wet on wet technique. And that's going to allow me to have a little bit more movement on my paper. So as the colors hit the paper, you'll almost see them like move around which is really cool. And I do want to give it a moment. Um, I want to give the water just a little bit of moment to like a little, a little bit of time is what I was trying to say. Words are hard today. Um, I want to give the water a little bit of time to soak into the paper because um, if I just apply my paint really quickly while the water is still getting absorbed, um, I may see that there are like pools of water across my paper. And different types of paper hold water differently. Um, even if you have like 100% cotton paper, um, which is um, really great paper, I think. 100% hundred, hundred cotton is a lot better than like um, paper that are made of other types of materials. Tends to hold water better, tends to hold paint a little bit better. Um, it's usually a little bit easier for your paper, like your paint to move on the paper. Um, sometimes when you have student grade paper, which is made of other materials, the paint just sits on top of the paper rather than soaking into it. So um, cotton paper is really great. I really like it. I don't even have any of the other paper now. I just I just only have the cotton paper. But um, yeah, you still got to give your water a little bit of time to soak in. So we've got plenty of water on there. I think the next thing that we're going to do is um, just kind of grab some paint and have fun with it. So 
I said that I was going to do a little bit with the 92, um, which is almost like a dark teal, which I love teal, so maybe I'm biased, but um, I think I'm going to kind of bring it along this corner section right here, and then maybe up a little. And then I just added a little bit of water to it. I realize you probably can't see my palette, so I'll do this. And if you ever feel like you have too much on your brush, you can just kind of dab it onto your um, onto your cloth, or you can dab it from this angle right here, and that just kind of helps get rid of the water without getting rid of the paint. And then maybe I'll just uh, kind of bring it right here. And then, I don't know, maybe I'll put a little bit right here. And then I'll wash that off. And then one of the other things I think would be kind of cool is I'll grab a little bit of yellow and I'll actually just like make the star at the very top here. And then I'll rinse that off. I'll just kind of help it blend out a little bit. All right. And then I think it could be fun to have a little bit of maybe like red bulbs in it. Bulbs. Am I saying that right? Um, so I'm gonna just like put some red right here. Put some red right here. Some right here. Some right there. And then maybe one right here. And then this is kind of like a forest green right here. So I'll kind of just add a little bit around the edges. And then as you're going, if you see something that you maybe don't love, like, sorry, I can't really get in here without hiding the, stealing the light. Um, I was just starting to get like a line of paint here that I didn't really want to be where it was. And so I'm just soaking it up with my brush. Sometimes that can happen, especially around the edges where paint starts to pool. And so you can just kind of take your brush and wipe some of that away. You can mix colors if you want. There's nothing that says that you have to do something a certain way, especially considering that and this is like an abstract painting. So we'll go back through at the end and we'll touch up the red a little bit. You may even add a little bit of uh, orange to the to the painting, to the star, we'll see.
And then if you want your painting to be a little bit darker, you can even do like I'm doing right now, where you're just putting it like directly on the paper from the from the pan. So I almost think this is a little bit too dark. Not quite what I was looking for, but watercolors also they typically dry a little bit of um, a little bit lighter than you maybe intend for them to so it's okay to to have them be a little bit um, darker up front than you expect so maybe I'll come through add a little bit more red here let it kind of just fill out All right, and then I think I'm going to grab a little bit of this light green over here. Just kind of apply a little bit of that. So I know you can't see it. I think that was 107, um, but it's a little bit lighter. And so I'm just adding that to the middle of the tree to just give it some fun color differentiation. And then again, I want to add a little bit right here. Um, and then I'll probably add a smidge here. And then, just as I did before, I'm going to come along the edges and pick up any paint that we didn't expect, or if it went where we didn't want it to go. We're just going to pick that up, so hopefully we can keep some of the green out of the Christmas star. But yeah, so we're just having fun with it. All right, so I'm going to turn this just to get a little bit better angle on it. And all I'm doing is just soaking up any extra. Just picking it up so that it doesn't end up looking a little different than we wanted it to. All right, so that looks great, and I think that we're ready to dry it. Now, normally I would let my watercolors just, oh, you know what? I totally forgot. This is going to be really fun. So I've got a little bit of salt, and all I'm going to do is sprinkle it, and you'll see that it gives it like a really fun textured look and um, I am going to leave that on there for a quick minute. It's almost going to give it like just kind of a spotted look and I thought that would be really fun with this type of design especially since trees have so many needles and you want them to look like they've got some extra texture to it. So I don't know if you can see it but it's got almost like a dotted textury kind of look to it. So basically, I try to, like the bigger chunks of salt you have, the bigger piece you would get, but this is just kind of um, table salt, so you just kind of see small speckles. But I'm going to let that sit for a moment. I'm going to move some of this paint stuff out of the way, and then I'm actually going to get my blow dryer or it's like a heating tool, but it's very similar to a blow dryer. Um, and I'm going to heat it up, dry it off, 
and then we will be able to take the tape off and move on to our next phase. I'm not done with the watercolors just yet, but I'm going to plug this in. Sorry, I'm trying to unravel the cord. I don't know if you can hear me making a fuss. This is probably going to be so loud. Oh, that was me dropping all my paintbrushes. That's what happens when you go live. Things just utter havoc, utter chaos over here. All right, so the table slot has set there for... I don't know, probably about a minute. So I'm gonna go ahead and dry it, and then we're gonna take the tape off and check it out. So if you can hear the heat tool, um, it's actually used for embossing and crafting, but I use it for watercolors as well. And it essentially, you just kind of like run it over the paper, it heats up the paper, and then as it's heating the paper, it kind of just dries it a little bit. Actually, I'll just move one piece of salt right there. But you can see it kind of drying as you, or I don't know, maybe you can't see it from the angle of the video, but I can see it. <laughs> I can see it drying. So we're gonna give it a little bit longer. Probably not fully dry yet. I can still see that the paper is a little wrinkly. So we're gonna give it a little bit more time. And I try not to get my heating tool too close to my paper. I probably have it about like six to eight inches away. So I'm not actually like, I'm not like burning the paper or like changing the chemistry of the paper. I'm just kind of I'm just kind of drying it and warming it. And you can use a blow dryer. You do not have to. Oops, sorry, I just bumped my camera. You do not have to use an, an embossing tool or a heat tool just for this. You can, you can just use a blow dryer and that would be fine. Um, you cannot use a blow dryer for embossing. So if you're trying to emboss, which I'm actually going to be doing here in a little bit, um, you do need an embossing tool for that, but you do not need an embossing tool for just drying your paint. All right, so I'm going to take off the top layers. And actually, maybe I'll just kind of wipe the salt off first. So I'm just kind of lightly taking my finger and just brushing the salt off. And you actually can't see me doing it now, but I'm brushing it into the trash. Um, but, all right. so now you'll see it just kind of has like a very like messy texture. And again, that's because of the salt. So I'm gonna take my paper off. And I'm not done with my tree yet, but I am mostly done. Um, the other thing I want to do is I, I want to put a little trunk on my tree because the stamp has a trunk, so I think the tree should have a trunk too. So I am going to bring my paints back. And bring my little cloth back. And I'm going to use like a brownish color for the tree stump. So if I'm referencing my little swatch sheet, I'll probably just use this 195 right here. So grab a little bit of that, 
and I'm just gonna give it a little stump. It doesn't need anything too big. And uh, that's about it. That's about all I'm gonna give it. And the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a little bit of some light brown just next to it and I'm gonna give it a little bit of a ground to sit on. And then I'm gonna rinse off my brush and I'm just gonna blend what's on the paper just going to blend it down a little bit and soften it. So it almost just kind of looks like a, the ground trails off a little. And my trunk is still wet, so if I get a little bit of my trunk onto the ground, that's completely okay. I think it adds a little bit of just kind of fun texture. And if I think that it's maybe faded too much, I can just grab a little bit more brown. I can just put it at the top, and you'll just kind of watch it seep down a little bit. And there you go. And again, you can make this as um, as intricate as you like. You could add maybe a little bit of grass, or you could um, add a flower, whatever you wanted. Let's say you maybe got a little too much paint in a certain area where you didn't want it. You can take your cloth and you can dab it off if you want. So pretty flexible. I just got a little bit of extra paint over there, so I was just kind of blotting it. All right, I'm going to do one more blot, and then we'll call it a day over there. So the last thing I want to do is dry the paint before I pull up my tape. So I'm gonna grab my embosser again, my embossing tool. I'm gonna let it heat up a little bit, and then I'm gonna turn it on my tree. And I'll start to be able to tell that it's dry because the paper will go back to its original shape it won't be wet, it won't be pliable, the paint won't look shiny anymore, and that's usually a pretty good indicator that it's, that it's dry. All right. So it looks dry, so I think we're okay. And I am gonna take a moment to move my paint away from my table in just a moment, because I don't wanna risk spilling any water. But let's do the big reveal.
All right. So here we go. Here is our Christmas tree. A very simple but yet really fun Christmas tree where you've got your little star at the top. You've got some bulbs around it. Now, you could do a, di a couple different things with this if you wanted to. Um, I'm going to put a stamp over top of it, and we already talked about that. But um, if you wanted, you could also, like draw garland on it. You could add different embellishments to it like sequin. You could put buttons on it. You could do all sorts of fun things here. So this is such a fun and easy project. Um, you don't need to be a master watercolor artist to make a project like this. And I think that that's one of the things that's really great. And um, as I'm talking, I'm just going to kind of move some of these paints out of the way. Um, but you don't have to be an expert to make a design like this. So I think something like this is really accessible to people who maybe feel overwhelmed by watercolors. Um, projects like this are kind of how I started with watercolors. And I really love doing like full paintings where it takes up the whole page, but they don't have to be like that. And a lot of people don't do full paintings like that at all. So. I don't know. If you're someone who feels intimidated by watercolors, I would say, you know, just start small. Do something that you think is fun and give it a try. And if it's not for you, then it's not for you. And that's totally cool. But sometimes you're surprised by things that you don't think will be for you. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is grab my Misty stamping tool. And my Misty is essentially going to allow me to stamp really um, easily. So I'll just, um, I always position it on the corner, like usually on the lower corner. And I'm going to put this here. I'm going to put that there and that there. But what I like to do Oh, and I still, have, I still have a couple speckles of salt on here, so let me just make sure they're all off. Um, but what I like to do is I like to put my stamp or my paper on the lower right-hand side because then if I find that I need to, like, reposition my paper or if I have to, like, if my paper moves during the stamping process, I can pretty easily put it back in the same spot because it's right up against this edge. If I put my paper in the middle and my paper moves during the stamping process, then I'm going to most likely not get it back in the same place where I need it to be when I'm trying to stamp it a second time. Um, I think that's particularly helpful with watercolor paper because watercolor paper is really, um, it's really textured. And so you may not get a good stamp on the first time. And you may have to do it a second time. So, I don't know. I find it to be super helpful. Okay. So, I'm just trying to line the stamp up with the, uh, with the tree. And there's a few things I actually want to get set up before I stamp. And that's going to be, I want to get my embossing ink, which you might laugh, but I actually use Distress Oxide ink as, um, as my embossing ink, mostly because it's just so easy to dual purpose. Um, I've used a few different types of embossing inks, and they've been okay, but they haven't really been my favorite. So I try to just kind of use what I have a lot of times and I have a lot of different colors of distress oxide ink so if I'm looking for like making a colored project uh, where I want the the words to be a certain color I'll uh, I'll use my distress oxide ink and then if I want my words to be like black then I'll use my black ink with clear embossing powder but I think for this one, what I'm going to use is my pumice stone 
So it's kind of like a gray, but the color of the ink doesn't matter so much right now because I'm actually going to cover it with this gold. Um, but this is like a warm gray, so this is just what I'm going to use for the stamp. So I'm going to get that out, get that settled. I'm going to open up my embossing powder, which actually I have not used this color before, so I don't know what it's going to look like. But I'm really excited to find out. It's it's still got the uh, the cover on it and everything, so it is brand brand new. Um, so it's exciting to be using something new, and uh, the uh, the protective cover just will not come off. So one second. As I take it off, it's very sticky. I'm trying to take all of it off because I always try to pour the, uh, the embossing powder right back into the container. So I want to make it easy to do that so I always try to get this this stuff off of it if I can okay so that's off so anyways my embossing powder I'm opened that up and I'm setting it off to the side then I'm also going to I'm also going to grab a piece of paper that I keep and when I'm embossing I'll just uh, sorry I'm just trying to grab it while I'm talking just a little piece of paper I just try to put the item that I'm emboss embossing in here and then I just shake off the rest and put it back in the container so I'll use that and then I know so many things to emboss how did how did I get here um, I use a like a what's it called a clothespin and I actually just hold it with a clothespin while I'm embossing because otherwise I tend to burn my fingers so I do that and then that absorbs the heat and then the last thing I need is my embossing tool which we already have out so okay so oh I lied I do need one more thing the last thing that I need is a powder tool so when you're embossing, static can make the little tiny fine embossing powder pellets, it can make it like just kind of go all over the place. So actually before I do any of this, I'll pick up my stamp with my MISTI tool. But then before I do anything else, I want to move my MISTI tool for a moment and I want to just hit it with this and again this is just getting rid of any potential static you don't need to cover it like you don't need a lot but it really does help and I've actually never used Nuvo embossing powder um, I use a lot of wow embossing powder and man this makes a world of difference for wow all right so I'm gonna put that back where it was Make sure it's right up against the edge. Just hold this down like that. And then I usually have to do this a couple times and maybe that's the big difference um, with Distress Oxide ink and embossing ink is like maybe I would only have to stamp it once if it was just regular embossing ink. But I usually have to do it a couple times when it's, uh, when it's Distress Oxide ink, but that's fine. So you can't see it yet, and hopefully it comes out a little bit better than it is right now, but I'm just going to firmly press it down. We're getting there. You can see a little bit more of the sentiment now. And again, I already expected this to be a little complicated. Um, because whenever you're putting a stamp on textured paper, it doesn't always translate like you want it to. So, quite honestly, we could do this whole thing and then end up not being happy with it. But you know what? 
That's okay. So I'm going to pour the embossing powder over it. Cover it really good. And then I'm just going to shake it off. And we've got a little extra embossing powder on the sides. Probably shouldn't be running my finger over it. I should be using like a paintbrush or something, um, but that's fine. So I want to melt this pretty quick. So I'm just going to set this powder off to the side and I'll tackle that in a minute. And I'm going to grab my little clothespin and my embossing tool. And then now, I actually will use my heating tool underneath. And sorry, it's, uh, it's probably a little closer to the camera than you'd want. But I will actually kind of use my embossing tool underneath the paper instead of above it because I feel like it blows around the... Uh, blows the powder around a little bit if you do it from the top. Okay, so this actually turned out really well. Um, it says, may your days be merry and bright. So I don't know if you can see it, but that actually that turned out pretty good. So, now that I've got my stamp and my sentiment, I think there's one more touch that I want to put on it, but I think I might wait until, until I get it on the card. And that is to add some Nouveau drops. So I think the Nouveau drops that I'm going to add are going to be this like reddish, I don't know if you can see it, it's like a reddish sparkly kind of color. And I might just kind of put it around the outside. So we're going to get to that in a moment. But in the meantime, I have a small crafting space. So there's a couple things I need to do first. And now you all get to see my daily routine. So how exciting. Um, one of the first things I would usually do is clean off my stamp. Um, I don't have, I use the stamp chamois, but I honestly forgot to get it wet. So <laughs> I'm just going to dip it into my watercolor water and I'm going to wet it like that. And so I only have like an edge of it wet. We're kind of improvising here because I don't want to walk away from my computer, but I'm just going to take it and I'm going to wipe off my Distress Oxide ink. And then I'll clean this stamp a little bit better after the live stream. So normally that gets a better cleaning, but I'm going to peel that off my Misty stamping tool. And if you're someone who doesn't have a stamping tool, um, I don't know if it doesn't have to be a Misty, like it can be... I think there's all sorts of them out there now, but if you don't have a stamping tool, it really does make everything so much easier. Um, it is absolutely worth it. I really like my Misty, but I've not had another stamping tool, so I can't vouch for the other ones. All right, so we're done with the baby powder. Um, I'm done with my water. I'm gonna set that off to the side. We still have our embossing powder out. We want to put that away so that's not a big mess. So I'm just literally going to just tap it in very gently. Get any excess in there. And then anything that's left on the paper, I just kind of shake it into the trash. And I save the paper. I always use the same paper because um, otherwise I'm scrambling and I have to run into the other room to get some printer paper. So, 
I usually just put things away as I'm clean as I'm crafting, but I also recognize that like all of my space is all of my stuff is in a really small space. So it's kind of easy for me to access everything. All right. So I don't know how well you can see this. I'll I'll get it a little closer. I'll get my light a little closer just so you can you can see, but it has like a uh it has like a um a gold sheen on it, which is really fun. Um and it says may your days be merry and bright. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put this on an A2 greeting card. So I need to trim this piece of paper a little bit. Uh, this was just a piece of watercolor paper that I had lying around, really. And I wanted to use it. And I felt like this would be something good to use it for. But we're going to trim it down a little bit. So I kind of keep a cheat sheet that I like to include my favorite card sizes. So this tree is a really good size for like an A1 greeting card. So I'm gonna grab my cutter. I'm actually gonna flip that upside down. Hopefully you can see it. I'm gonna do that. And then the size of this card is going to be um, three and three eighths by four and seven eighths. So I need to pick the color of my card base. And I haven't done that yet because I really wasn't sure how the card was going to turn out, like how the actual image was going to turn out. So I think that I always keep a few bases just kind of lying around. And I kind of feel like I want this to be like a craft card base like this because I just think that the that all just goes really well together so this is actually an A2 card base so I need to kind of trim it down and make it a little bit smaller so if I open up this card base what I really need for it to be is okay. What I really need for it to be is seven by four and seven eighths. I've always had trouble with this one, so. This is going to be a little tricky. So this is what I want, but I can't just cut that edge off because then my score will be in the wrong place. So if it's seven right where I want it to be, yeah, actually, I may just grab a new piece of paper and score it and go through all that because then I won't have to go through the headache of trying to, like, match the score lineup. So... I'm going to change up my plan. I still am going to use craft paper, but it's just going to look a little different. Okay. So I'm going to cut this to be four and seven eighths here. So if you're trying to figure out what seven eighths is, um, each of these, let me just like zoom in a little bit. Um, if you're trying to figure out what seven eighths is, each of these tall lines right here, that's an eighth. So you would just count, um, so four and seven eighths would be one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So seven would be right here. So I'll cut it right here. Okay. 
and then need it to be seven here. So usually what I do is I try to look at what side is like the cleanest edges that aren't crinkled or anything like that. I'm gonna just make sure my measurements are right. All right. So that is four and seven eighths, but I'm not done because the way my scoring board works is I, oops, my cutting board fell. Sorry for all the ruckus today. So the way my scoring board works is I actually have to, maybe I should have just prepped this card base at, before we started, but I didn't really know what it was, uh, what I was gonna need. All right, we're improvising again because I can't find my um, my like bone thing that um, that makes that helps me score. So basically, the reason that I am not done cutting is because I have to score it, and then after I score it, I have to trim a little bit more off just because of the nature of my board. Like I can't make smaller score lines than this, but I actually need a line that's in between these two. So I'll score it, fold it, and then I'll take the last little bit off. So. So if I divide seven by two, then that would mean that my line is going to be about three, three and a half, I think. Let's check my math. Yeah, three and a half. Okay. So right about here, just going to very easily make a scoring line. Again, normally I would have like a tool to do this, but I am just in the habit of improvising today. So I'm using my scissors as my tool. Okay, so now you'll see I have a nice little score line. So I'm gonna just take this and I'm gonna fold it in half. And then if I just kind of show you what I'm doing, you'll see that this is the envelope for um, an A1 card. And so like a finished card wouldn't actually fit in this envelope, it would be too big. So I need to take off just a smidge more. And then I'll be ready to trim down my tree and put it on my card and add an extra embellishment. I actually don't cut A1 cards very often, so I really had to check my math to make sure I didn't <laughs> to make sure I didn't screw that one up. All right. So, now I'm going to come back here and I need to take off one more eighth. So this is where my card starts out at about three and a half. So, and maybe I'll even take off like a half of an eighth, a sixteenth, and just see how it looks. And again, I just use my envelope as a gauge I look at all four sides and I try to say, is this even? Does it look like it needs a little bit more space? And I personally think it needs just a smidge more space. So we're gonna stick with the eighth measurement. I'm gonna take off a little bit more. 
And this is like one of the nice things about card making is that you don't have to have everything figured out. Like you don't have to have everything figured out before you start. A lot of this is like process of elimination. You try something, it doesn't work. You change your technique next time. You try something a second time, maybe that doesn't work. You change your technique again. So you just kind of keep changing it until you like the way your design looks. And even if you don't like it, I would venture to guess that somebody will. So I put my cutting tool away a little too soon. I forgot I needed to cut my tree. So I know that my card base is um, a little less than three and a half by a little less than five. Uh, so I need this Christmas tree to be a little bit smaller as well. So I will do, so like three and a half, like where the actual size of the card is, is here. But I can't just cut it like that because then my tree will be uneven. So right now my tree's at four. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take it slow. I'm going to take off about a quarter inch on this side. Then I'm going to turn it around and take a quarter inch off the other side. Uh, this is also really nice if you think that you maybe made a design that you wanted to be centered and then you realize it's not centered. You can always like take a little bit more off one side then take it off another side and just kind of keep going till you like get that desired look that you're going for. All right, so this is this is three and a half. Well, a little less than three and a half. So I'm stopping because I want to look at what side is the smallest. Like what side has less um, less on the other side. So I'll do this. And um, I also kind of do it this way because I'm not great at math. So I really want to make sure that I'm like able to pick a design that I like and like work with it how I want. So you'll see now I have like a little bit of a border, which is what I wanted. I could even make it smaller if I wanted to and have a little bit more of a border but I think it's pretty even on both sides. If anything, I think I could just take a smidge more off of this side and that would be fine. So maybe I'll do that. And then the other thing that I have to do is you'll see when I kind of hold it up, the, um, whoops, sorry, the top is actually, it has a little less space than the sides. So I want to take a little bit off the top and the bottom, but truthfully, I don't want to take too much, just a smidge. So um, I'll do about, I'll do a quarter here. And actually we'll do a little bit more on the bottom because I think I like the spacing where the star is. So I don't want to cut too much off of that. So yeah, so now if I just kind of set this down, you can see that it's mostly even. If anything, I think I can take a smidge more off the bottom, but no more than like a 16th of an inch. So I think that's what I'll do. So again, just kind of holding it to the paper, seeing how it looks. So I like that. I'm happy with it. Um, sometimes people try to get it all in one go. You definitely can do that if you want, but um, I don't know. I find that if I just take it slow, I can always cut more off. If I go too fast and I cut too much off, then I can't really do anything about that. And I'm just kind of using it how it is. So.
All right, so I've got my card base. I've got my back. I can set this down like on the card base and I can center it. Um, but it's a little wrinkly, like it's a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a little wavy. So the paper, just the way it dried, it, um, it is a little bit wavy. So normally if I was doing this not all in one city sitting, I would actually just kind of put it in a really heavy book and let it flatten out overnight. Because we're doing this all on the live stream, I am going to do it a little bit differently. So I'm going to skip that part, or maybe I'll just do that after, um, after our uh, live stream. But instead, I'm going to grab this score tape right here, and I'm going to just line my watercolor paper with score tape. Now, there's a lot of different types of tape out there. The reason I use score tape for watercolor paintings specifically is because it is extremely sticky and it will help your paper not be so like I don't know warped so as your paper just kind of looks a little flimsy right now not flimsy that's not even the right word but you can just tell that it's not sitting flat like it's when you look at it on the on the table you can see that you know it's a little bit it's a little bit wavy so the score tape helps keep it in place. It's also really nice if you have this on like 110 pound paper. Um, I don't have it on 110 pound paper. I actually have it on like 65 pound paper. So um, it can kind of make your card wiggle a little bit. It can make your card look a little wavy itself. But I try to put the sticky tape on it, the score tape, and I put it around all four sides. And then I'll also put some in the middle. So that usually helps me. And then I may actually put the Nouveau dots on after. I don't know. We'll see. Um, because what I'm also thinking about doing is I could stick it inside of a book and I could flatten it out. But I'll just put a couple pieces over here. And it really is pretty quick. Um, I know a lot of people use tape runners. I feel like I say this frequently, but um, I haven't had a lot of luck with tape runners. Um, I have found that some of them have really strong adhesive, but others have not very strong adhesive and it just peels up or um, I just feel like I'm wasting tape because it just like runs and runs and runs. But Score tape is definitely my favorite when it comes to watercolor paintings. Oh, the other thing I was going to say is if you let your paper dry naturally rather than taking a heating tool to it, I sometimes find, maybe other people feel differently, um, I sometimes find that it's a little bit less wavy. So... All right, uh, so I've got a little off center. I'm gonna try and peel it up a little bit. I don't know that I'll be able to, but I'm gonna try. Whoops, sorry, I'm gonna bump my camera a smidge. So I'm just gonna do that and do that. So here is my finished design. And the other thing I usually will do is this paper is a little bit too sm too big, so I'll trim that down after the the live stream today, but I'll usually put like an insert in my card as well so that there's a white space for um, writing. And then the last thing I'll usually do is I'll put my little logo on the back. So one thing I'm not going to do on the stream, which I was going to do it, but I really want my card to just sit under a heavy book, is putting some Nouveau drops on. So you'll see the final pictures, but essentially Nouveau drops are like glue. 
and you just place a dot like all around the design and then it hardens and it gives it this really cool effect. So I am gonna put Nuvo Drops on it, but I'm just not gonna do it yet. So you'll see it in the pictures, but here is the final product of my card, my watercolor card that says, may your days be merry and bright. And this really only took me about an hour and 15 minutes. And I talked most of the time about how I did it and what products I used and things like that. Um, I'll get my light just a little bit closer so that you can maybe see it a little bit better. But if you have any questions about how I made this card or what products I use, I'll be putting a lot of that information in the description after this live. But thank you guys so much for stopping by. Um, thank you so much for your support um, ongoing. And we've got a lot of really exciting things coming up in the new year, so stay tuned. Uh, more information is coming on that in January. But um, if you ever want to check out my tutorials, you can find them on YouTube. You can also find them at onepaperstreet.com. Uh, and then I also am pretty active on Instagram, at onepaperstreet and Pinterest at one paper street. So O-N-E paper street like you see on the lower left hand side of the screen. Thank you everybody so much. Have a